Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the structure of uh, the glycine receptor and uh, we're also discussing the involvement of the glycine receptor in uh, hyperecplexia. Right, so we are in the process of discussing the structure of the glycine receptor and I am just about to describe to you what a cis loop is. Now I want to stress that I have drawn the extracellular domain here in orange and the extracellular domain that I have drawn is absolutely dominated by this cis loop here. So this is the cis loop, which I'm just going about to discuss. The reality is that the extracellular domain has a lot else to offer other than just the cis loop. I have um, stressed the cis loop because that's the uh, structure after which the cis loop ligand gated ion channels are named. However, it's a minor part of the extracellular domain. So these portions that are tiny here, that are the uh, portions of the extracellular domain that aren't the cis loop, they are in fact far bigger uh, than the cis loop itself. Okay, so there's a lot more to the extracellular domain that I'm not showing you, basically. Okay, so let me talk about what the cis loop is then. So basically, it's a loop in the polypeptide structure. So this line, by this line, I uh, am representing a polymer of amino acids. So this represents a polypeptide. Amino acid joined to amino acid joined to amino acid joined to more amino acids. And then I'm suddenly going to amplify one amino acid out. So I'm going to give this amino acid a far, far bigger structure than the other amino acids. And that's because it's very, very important for holding together the structure of the cis loop. So here's the amino group of this amino acid. Here's the alpha carbon, the hydrogen off the alpha carbon. And then the R group of uh, this amino acid is going to be a methylene group. And then with a file group off the side. Okay, now um, this amino acid is by the name of cysteine, and file groups have this structure. They have a sulfur atom with a hydrogen off, so this is a file group. Now it's very similar to a alcohol group, uh, in but instead of having an oxygen bound to a hydrogen, instead you have a sulfur bound to a hydrogen, but sulfur is in group 6 of the periodic table, it's below oxygen, uh, so it's got very similar chemical properties. Okay, so then below it we then have the carboxylic acid group, which will be involved in this amide link um, to the next amino acid's amino group, but we won't show the next amino acid, instead we'll go back to showing our polypeptide as just a line. Okay, and the polypeptide loops around like this, hence the name cis loop. And then on this opposing strand, you'll then have some other amino acid, which will also be a cysteine. So here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon with the hydrogen coming off it. Here's the methylene group. And then off the methylene group, you'll have another file group, and these two sulfur atoms will be bound together like so. And then you'll have the carboxylic acid group there. And then the polypeptide will continue. Now the important thing for the holding together the structure of this cis loop is this disulfide bond. And I'm living dangerously. I'm using yellow. That probably doesn't show up at all. Never mind. So this is the disulfide bond. Okay. Also known as a disulfide bridge. So this is the disulfide bond between these two file groups or a disulfide bridge. And this is what is involved in um, holding the cis loop structure together. So basically this is called a cis loop because the two amino acids here are both cysteine amino acids. So you have formed this disulfide bond between the file groups on two cysteine amino acids and the free letter amino acid code for cysteine is cis. So that's why this whole structure is known as a cis loop because it's a loop in the polypeptide structure that is held together by uh, cysteine residues. Okay, so that's what a cis loop is. So, all of this discussion now, it applies exactly the same. It's, I would have discussed this identically, and indeed I have in other videos, uh, if I was describing nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and GABA-A receptors. They are all pentamers. Their membrane-spanning topologies are exactly like this, and they have um, this uh, 
cis loop structure in the extracellular domain. Now we go on to what's specific for glycine receptors. So, the simple thing would be for there to be one glycine receptor gene, okay, in the human genome, and that would um, produce us a protein that have membrane-spanning topology like this, and uh, the extracellular domain would bind glycine, and then all we'd have to do is make five copies of this protein and stick them all together, and we'd then have a glycine receptor. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Instead, there are five genes encoding for glycine receptor subunits, okay? Now, uh, four of these are grouped into the alpha family. So you have the alpha family, which has four members, the alpha-1 gene, the alpha-2 gene, the alpha-3 gene, and the alpha-4 gene. And these produce the alpha-1 subunit, the alpha-2 subunit, the alpha-3 subunit, and the alpha-4 subunit. There is then the beta gene making up the fifth gene. So, you have these four, sorry, these five separate genes, which all have slightly different sequences of organic bases, which leads to the making proteins with slightly different sequences of amino acids, but they all have this same membrane-spanning topology shown here, and they're all similar enough that they can be used to make up a fifth of a glycine receptor, like so, okay? Um, so... You do have these five separate subunits, but they are all glycine receptor subunits. Now, which, how do you actually assemble these into pentamers is the question. Because the simplest way of doing it, the way that would make the most sense and would be nice on the mind, is to just have five alpha-1 subunits put together to make an alpha-1 glycine receptor, have five alpha-2 subunits put together to make an alpha-2 glycine receptor, and so on. And you'd get five separate glycine receptors. Now, these are not found uh, in the human body, basically. I think the alpha-1 homopentamer is found in the human body, but its expression is not that important. Uh, the form of the glycine receptor that is really important, and is the form that would be involved in the um, inhibition of alpha motor neurons that I've described to you, is what's known as the alpha-1 beta form of uh, the glycine receptor. So it's called the alpha-1 beta glycine receptor. So, it is a heteropentamer, okay, so I'll write that down. It's a heteropentamer, which means that the subunits you use to make the pentamer are not all the same, basically. You're using alpha-1 and beta subunits, so that you're using two separate subunits, and that's why it's called a heteropentamer. Okay? Now, what I would love, absolutely love, to be able to tell you is um, how these are assembled to make the five-membered receptor. But unfortunately, it just isn't known, basically. So, if this is our receptor here, Okay, we know that it should have five uh, com um, subunits coming together to make this glycine receptor. And it's just not known how you actually put these together. The stoichiometry even is not something that's agreed upon. You, you can either have... Uh, it looks as though there's varied stoichiometry, basically. It looks as though some of these alpha-1 beta receptors will have two alpha-1 subunits and then three beta subunits. But how you arrange them uh, together isn't known. So this stoichiometry um, isn't even uh, set upon, basically. And we certainly don't know how you arrange them, i.e. do you put both alpha-1s next to each other and then the three betas in a line like so, or do you put... Uh, a beta in between the two alpha ones. These things just are not known, basically. Okay. Um, in addition, uh, this stoichiometry isn't even set. So, for instance, we also think three alpha ones, two betas, may well be expressed. In addition, there may even be four alpha ones and a beta. So, basically, it's not understood the stoichiometry of the subunits, and it's certainly not understood how they're arranged. What we do know for sure is that uh, the main form of glycine receptors has both alpha-1 subunits and beta subunits in. We can do that. You know, you can do simple experiments to show that. You can uh, take a glycine receptor. You can break it down into its constituent um, uh, subunits, and then 
run a western blot, basically, denature them, run a western blot to separate the alpha 1 and the beta subunits out, and then you'll see two distinct bands on the, gli on the western blot corresponding to the alpha 1 and the beta subunits, and that shows us that these glycine receptors were formed of both alpha 1 and beta subunits. Right, okay, um, so... Um, Basically, uh, the main form of the glycine receptor is this alpha-1 beta heteropentamer, where you have some alpha-1 receptors and some beta receptors. And also, uh, an edgy fact that isn't quite agreed upon or set is that it seems to be the alpha-1 receptors which bind to the glycine. So, you would think that the number of glycines that the receptor binds would be the same as the number of alpha-1 subunits it has, but we, we're not even sure how many alpha-1 subunits it has, so it's not a particularly helpful fact. Okay, right. So, all we know from that discussion is that the main form of glycine receptor contains both alpha-1 and beta receptor subunits. Okay, right. So now let's move on to hyperecplexia, but we'll do that in the next video.